really happy to be here and I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, uh, joining us today is Dr. Henry Huntington. He is uh, the Arctic Science Director at Ocean Conservancy and also the lead author of the Alaska chapter on the next, on the next National Climate Assessment. He has over 30 years experience in Arctic research and conservation. Much of his work is focused on human environment interactions, especially involving indigenous peoples in Alaska, Canada, and elsewhere. He's contributed to many uh, major international projects, and he currently serves as a co-chair of a National Academy of Sciences Committee on Emerging Research Questions in the Arctic, and as a member of a Canadian Council of Academies panel on food security in the North. He's author of over 100 papers and several books, including the meaning of ice about sea ice in Arctic communities. Now, the, his presentation today, he's going to talk about um, the sea ice and how it's been changed. He will review changes in Arctic sea ice and then explore the implications for Arctic societies and for the world as a whole. Um, Henry, thanks for joining us. The topic is Arctic sea ice and indigenous peoples. Well, thank you very much, Mater and, and Gail for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to speak today. I'm now going to, whoops, I may have shared the wrong thing. Um, you probably don't need to look at my calendar. How's that? Um, yeah, it's there. Okay, let me just make sure I start at the beginning rather than at the end. And, and you might and go into presenter mode. There we go, how's that? Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Well, thanks. As, as Gail had mentioned, I will talk about Arctic sea ice and indigenous peoples and other aspects of Arctic sea ice as well for, for people near and far uh, from, from the Arctic. Um, Gail had given you a bit of, bit of my background. I, I won't go into this uh, too much more other than I have had some experience around the Arctic. Um, a lot of my research has been with indigenous peoples. I am not indigenous myself. I grew up in, in Massachusetts. I'm of European descent. Uh, came to Alaska in the spring of 1988 to count bowhead whales off the North Coast and quickly became fascinated by the way that the Inupiat there interacted with their environment, with the sea ice, with the, the bowhead whales and more. Um, and that became then the focus of my, my graduate work and my, my career since then. Um, I've, as Gail had mentioned, I work now also with, uh, for Ocean Conservancy doing conservation work, which to me is an extension of what I've been doing in research of trying to understand how people interact with their environment, what effect that has on the environment and on people, and how we can learn from those experiences to look after the, the world that we've been given. Um, I've also had the great good fortune to be able to make some long trips by snowmobile, dog team, and small boat, uh, long in this case, meaning in multi-week. Um, and I have mentioned that I've, I've had that experience. I've been able to get out and by comparison to many of the people that I will be talking about today, I am uh, you know, very much an amateur. Uh, you know, I've, I've been out a few times on these kind of trips for many of the people I will be talking about, many of the people I've learned from. That is much more a, a, a way of life and, and uh, maybe I'll have time to, to work in a little story about that at, at, uh, at the appropriate time. Um, for the talk itself, we have a lot to cover. Uh, don't be daunted by the list. We're not going to spend a huge amount of time on any of these, but my hope is that what I will be able to give you is a, a fairly broad introduction to sea ice, to the ways that indigenous peoples understand and, and use and interact with sea ice, and to some of the other uh, you know, larger global concerns relating to sea ice and, and why that matters. Um, we won't go into great detail on any of these. Any of these could be the subject of a you know, a whole webinar could be the subject of a you know an entire semester long course or a book. Um, you know, many people have spent their careers looking at at one or more things on this list. Nonetheless, I hope to be able to give you a, an introduction, whet your appetite a little bit, give you a sense of you know, why I find this to be so interesting and, and exciting, and hopefully a, a sense of of if and how this connects to to your life, to the, the things you're interested in, to what happens in, in your neighborhood and, and beyond as well. And uh, I should give a little mention of the, of the photos. I'll try to remember to, to do that as I go. This is a photo of the, the uh, 
a new pad dance group in Wainwright, Alaska on the North Coast. They have their drums out. They're pausing between songs, but ready to, to sing some more songs in the high school gym as part of a big potluck dinner for a bunch of visitors who were in town. Um, often a, you know, a very festive occasion and a you know, tremendous display of, of uh, both tradition and culture and the invitation for others to share. Speaking of sharing, um, I'll start by talking a bit about lands and peoples. I've had the great good fortune to work in uh, around Alaska, many communities around Alaska, also in Canada, Greenland, uh, Northern Scandinavia and Finland, also in, in Russia in the uh, good old days. Um, and one of the common experiences that I've had throughout has been to experience the, the tremendous dedication that people have to sharing their generosity. And this you know, often is the case of Arctic peoples is, is expressed in terms of food. You know, the, the first caribou that a young hunter gets will be shared with an elder to know for the first seal. When people catch things, the first thing to do is, is to share. Uh, whaling captains go to tremendous expense and effort to uh, land a bowhead whale and then give almost all of it away to others in the community. This also extends to the sharing of, of hospitality, of information, of ideas. Um, and again, I've been the, the very fortunate beneficiary of that uh, in countless communities around the Arctic. Um, and I try not to take that for granted because I have to recognize that an awful lot of people who look somewhat like me um, have been doing things that we should really shouldn't be proud of in, in the Arctic and in, in other societies where colonialism has, has taken a toll. Um, nonetheless, throughout all of that, uh, you know, the, the I wouldn't, wouldn't say quite universal, but certainly the over, overwhelming response and reception that I've enjoyed and others have enjoyed in, in the Arctic has been one of, of generosity and based on this idea of sharing. And in this picture, we have Peter Josie, the, the upper hand, uh, an elder, Gwich'in elder from Old Crow in the Yukon Territory is giving us some travel tips. We're on a, a long snow machine trip and the, the hand holding the pen belongs to Matthew Sturm, uh, a snow scientist from Fairbanks who is leading the trip. And Peter is giving us some pointers of where we should be going and what we should be looking out for as we continue up the Porcupine River and then try to cross over the Richardson Mountains and get over into the drainage of the Mackenzie River. And without the guidance of people like Peter, um, you know, the trip would be possible, but it would be, it would be a lot harder and we would be getting lost a lot more and encountering difficulties that you know, we couldn't anticipate, but, but local people, of course, are, are well aware of. And so we're very grateful to people like Peter willing to take the time and, and uh, to, to share what they know. I live in Eagle River, a suburb of Anchorage in Alaska. Uh, my house is not quite visible in the right-hand photo. It's just behind the the ridge line to the coming down through the, the middle of the photo. Um, this is Denina land. The Denina have been here for countless generations. And one of the things that I truly appreciate about this area is the abundance that we enjoy of open land, of, of forest, of tundra, uh, doll sheep, as you see in the, in the photo on the left, uh, moose, bears, wolves, coyotes, and, and much, much more throughout this area. Um, and that you know, that has been there throughout the the uh, the presence of the Denina in this area, and we can take a lesson from their stewardship of of this magnificent environment. Much of my work has taken place in other places. Um, I'd mentioned the Inupiat already, the Inuit Inuit from North Greenland. Now, this is a photo from a, a project we were doing. We were on Baffin Island in in northern Canada. Uh, I'm the one in the lying down with the yellow jacket in the front. Um, but this involves some, some people again from, from around the region. Um, and you know, once more, I just express my gratitude to them for the, the welcome that they have provided, the ability to be able to work and travel with them, to learn from them about, about their lands and, and the details of, of their, their heritage and experiences and, and to enjoy their tremendous good, good humor um, and, and skill as we travel on the land. So I'd also like to set the context when we're talking about any aspect of the Arctic environment and we're talking about people, the social context is very important too. Ben Itak, shown here as a whaling captain from what is now Utkiagvik, what was formerly Barrow, the northernmost community in Alaska. 
And we had to, um, I'd like to illustrate sort of the, the extent of change that someone like Ben had seen in his life. Um, the, this picture is taken on a Sunday afternoon in January. Remember that Sunday afternoon in January, we'll come back to that. Um, and for some reasons that I, again, I'll mention in a moment, um, it made me think of what I knew about Ben and, and what he'd been through and what his life had been like. He had been born in a, in a remote cabin, 100, 150 miles east of, of Point Barrow on the North Coast. Um, this is a photo of a cabin in a different place. The North Slope in that area is very flat, but it gives you an idea of the type of cabin we might be talking about. One, maybe two rooms. Uh, the family would have been in there. His dad would have been a fur trapper at a time when Arctic fox skins were immensely valuable. There probably would have been another family, say another 20 miles along the coast in either direction. So pretty isolated, but they would have had a few people coming to visit now and then. Um, you know, and that would have been the life that, that he was accustomed to until he was about age, say six or seven, and it was time for him to go to school. And at that point, the family moved to the big city. This is not Barrow or Utkiagbik. This is Point Hope at the east end of the North Slope. Um, but Point Hope today is about the size that, that Barrow would have been then, uh, six, 700 people. Um, and you know, for Ben, this would have been the big city. He was used to living out without not being in sight of anybody else's house. And all of a sudden he was in a, a place with a, a several hundred people and having to go to school and probably having to, to learn English at school. Um, and depending on exactly when he was at school and what the customs were, he may have had his mouth washed out with soap for, for speaking his own language, the only language he knew instead of speaking English the way that uh, the schools wanted, the, wanted the, the students to. This would have been a big and jarring change for, for Ben coming to the big city. Um, no, that, that's his early life. And then he spends his life in, in, uh, in Barrow and then Utkiagvik. Learning the skills of, of whaling, learning traveling on the land. I, I can't remember what his occupation was, um, but living his life, becoming a, a well-respected elder in the in the community. So back to Sunday afternoons in January. Well, what happens on Sunday afternoons in January? NFL playoffs happen. When we would take a break during the meeting, Ben would scurry out to the car door, pull out his phone, and check on the scores of the latest game to see how he was doing in his betting polls. And it just struck me of what a change from what he had grown up with to what he was experiencing uh, you know, and once we were into the 21st century. And you know, I'm sure if you'd asked Ben, he would recognize that that had been a tremendous change. But I don't think he would say that you know, his identity had changed or his understanding of himself or his relationship with the, the environment had changed. Um, oftentimes we see people talking about whether, you know, Native American populations are, are traditional, whether they continue to live their lives and their, their old lifestyles. And you know, in, in some respects, of course not. People are using cell phones, driving cars, flying in planes, and all the rest. In other respects, many of the aspects of, of culture, and I think for someone like Ben, many of the things that are central to his identity um, do remain the same and, and do remain constant. Sharing remains crucially important to Ben and his understanding of his place in the community and his relationship with, with the whales, with the caribou, with the seals, and, and with the rest of the environment. Um, and so let's keep that in mind that there has been tremendous change, but a lot of things also stay the same and a lot of things continue. So you know, we may lose, we may win, but we also, we also retain much even in the midst of all of this kind of change. So, Finally, we'll get into, get into sea ice. Sea ice, it's a stunning environment. If you've ever had the chance to be there to see photos, um, you know, it, it can be just a, a, an inspiring and enthralling environment. This is what captivated me when I first went up to the Arctic in the spring of 88, as I mentioned, standing out on the edge of the ice for uh, well, shifts of, of four hours with a pair of binoculars looking for bowhead whales as they swam by. Um, camping out on the ice between the shifts, uh, you know, just getting to, to see so much and to, to experience that environment. I was very pleased in, in these photos, the left-hand photo, my two kids on the ice edge looking at a beluga whale swim by. Um, it was just wonderful to be able to share that experience with them and give them a sense of the, you know, the wonder and, and awe of a, 
of a magnificent environment when they were when they were younger. Uh, the right hand side, my younger one, uh, up playing on the sea ice. Oh, it's a tremendous sort of natural playground and wonderful place. And all interesting shades of blue and things going on, things to to learn about and to see. Um, so, you know, that's certainly one aspect of, of, of the sea ice environment for me, at least, is just how, how magnificent it is. Let's not forget that it's also supremely hazardous. This is a dynamic environment. Things are moving. Ice, ice can pile together, break apart, uh, you know, can crack underneath you, and all of a sudden you're over a bunch of open water instead of nice solid ice. And pile together and, and cover up the, the, your former campsite, your trails, you, know, you if you're standing in the wrong place and, and don't get out of the way. A lot of this is somewhat predictable with experience, but a lot of it is, is uncertain. And a lot of the, the predictions or, or decisions we make about sea ice uh, you know, are, are based on, on probability and on, on the likelihood of, uh, of, of danger. I'll come back to that idea in a, in a moment as well. And I think for many of us, you know, this idea that sea ice being a, you know, perhaps beautiful, but also stark, alien, and you know, ultimately very dangerous environment is, is probably a, you know, a fair characterization and a, a, a very reasonable approach to take to it. With that in mind, uh, I'll now talk about Wesley Aiken, pictured here, another elder from, from Utkiagvik. Probably that same Sunday afternoon meeting that we talked about with Ben. Um, and I asked Wesley at some point, I said, well, hey, when you think of sea ice, what do you think of? And without hesitation, he got a, a, a big smile and he just said, a beautiful garden. And I thought, well, that's really remarkable perspective. And, and, and I spent enough time on sea ice to have some idea of what it felt like. I certainly had never thought of it as a beautiful garden. But as Wesley said that, it became so clear how, why he would see it that way. This was a, an environment he was very familiar with. He'd spent his life on the on the shore of the Arctic Ocean, going out onto the ice after whales, walrus, seals, and more um, you know, in, in the company of others, doing the things that connect him to, to place and to culture and to the environment. And it was a, a landscape that had provided, that continues to provide for people. This is the source of food, the source of not just of, of uh, you know, calories and so on, but what in Inupiaq is Nikipiaq, which is kind of the real food, our food, the food that matters, the food that makes you feel like who you are. And I've heard that repeated many times by Nupiak friends and colleagues that, you know, boy, it sure is nice to eat that Nupiak. It really brings you back to a, a strong sense of who you are. The ice is the vehicle, the, the place where this happens. And so it's understandable and that Wesley would describe it as a beautiful garden. Still for me, a little jarring to think of that cold and forbidding environment in, in terms of a nice agricultural and even biblical metaphor. Um, but you know, that one thing I really appreciate about the chance to spend time with people like Wesley is the, the chance to see that very different perspective about the Arctic, to see why for, for people who live there, it's not the, the, you know, the, the brutal and unforgiving environment that, that many of us think of it as, but is also uh, a a place of home and comfort and, and familiarity. So we've mentioned the idea of sea ice and, and tradition and being, uh, being a place where people continue to do the things that have been done for countless generations. This is a whaling camp on the, the edge of the ice offshore from, from Utkiagvik. Uh, the whalers are wearing white parkas as a degree of camouflage. The, the canvas tent, of course, is, is white or close to it. Um, they're strenuously avoiding wearing or having things that are red. That, that's something that apparently the bowhead whales really pick up on. Um, and so when I had a red neck gaiter at one point and was visible from the ice edge and the whalers made, made sure to tell me quickly to <laughs> cover that up or take it off or do something with it because it was not appropriate. Uh, they built up, as you can see, ice or snow blocks along the, the ice edge, not completely to conceal the, the tent. Obviously, they're not sufficient for that. But just to break up the straight lines and and make it less evident that people are sitting there waiting for uh, for the whale to come by and uh, you know in their view give itself to the worthy hunters to, to provide for the community. 
But this sense of tradition is very deeply embedded in, in people's conception of sea ice and the way that they, they think about it and, and talk about it and use it. Also, a, as we've talked about quite a bit, a source of food and that sense of being of freedom, being out to, to travel where you'd like, how you'd like, when you'd like. In this picture, Isa Kidluck from Clyde River on Baffin Island is waiting by a, a seal breathing hole on the, on the ice going on a trip up the fjord. Um, it's not that we set out to go seal hunting, but we passed a seal hole. And if you're living in this environment, you don't pass up opportunities to look for food. And so Isa was, wanted to spend a little time at the seal hole just to see if a seal did in fact come there and would be something he could get for, uh, for dinner. And that sense of being able to be out and to, to do what you want, I think, for, for many people is, is extremely important. Uh, you know, life in, in today's communities often can be constraining in many ways. You know, the, all of the, the usual daily concerns of you know, paying the bills and, and getting to work and dealing with the leak in your roof and everything else, those are all there for people, as well as a sense of having to interact with you know, the, the dominant society in, in uh, in the state or province or territory or country where you live. Getting out on the ice, on the other hand, is getting away from, from much of that and a chance for people just to feel, you know, to feel themselves in, in ways that often are harder to do in, uh, in other, other circumstances. This was a theme that came out very strongly in some of the conversations I've had with, uh, with people from around the Arctic about sea ice. It's also a place for innovation. And I think this is a characteristic aspect of Inuit society is the, the, the ability and desire to innovate and to be flexible. Uh, on the right, the picture on the right, Ilkuang Tikjuak, also from Clyde River, um, really remarkable fellow, One, wonderful guy. He's a, a carver of, of polar bears out of marble and dolomite, um, um, avid, avid hunter and fisherman. I think he may have a, say, a third grade education, if, if that. Um, he speaks, uh, you know, at best broken English, um, and yet nothing seems to slow him down or daunt him. A friend who was living in Clyde River was had gotten a, an artificial Christmas tree and had set up, you know, the tree with the lights on it and was trying to figure out how to get the lights to to work and so on. And she went over to Ilku's house. Ilku not only had set up his tree and put up his lights, but he'd synced his lights with the music on his phone, so the lights were pulsating to the beat of the music that he was playing. No problem for Ilku, you know, even if he doesn't speak a language that's supported by his phone. Ilku apparently had seen a, a TV show about catching turbot, Greenland halibut, big flat fish, not the fish shown in this picture, um, but nonetheless a fish in the, the deep waters of Baffin Bay off the coast from where he lives. And Ilku being Ilku thought, well, we should be able to catch those too. He did his homework. He figured out how to rig up a, a big long line fishing system. You can see the big winch in the background or reel um, for the line to pay out. This is in several hundred feet of water. I uh, figured out how to set up the, the, the line and the hooks and the, the equipment that it would pay out and not just wind up in a big snag on the, on the bottom of the, the ocean or in a big tangle. I uh, figured out, went on to, apparently went on to Google Earth to look at the bathymetry of the, the ocean floor around where he lived and find a nice deep place that would make sense for looking for, for turbot. You know, plug those coordinates into his GPS, headed out on a snow machine, dug a hole and deployed his line through it and came back a day later. And there he is catching fish. Um, and you know, this is a guy who at the time, at least was at least in his 60s, if not his, his early 70s, always looking for something new, always looking for a, for a possibility, always you know, exercising his, his mind and his creativity. And I think for many people, again, that's the sense that they get from sea ice is a, a place where these kinds of things are possible. Hey, you have a good idea? Well, let's go try it out. Nobody's going to tell you not to. Nobody's going to stop you. Maybe nobody's going to help you, but that's okay. You know, if you're Oku, you can, there's an awful lot you can manage to do on your own. You know, maybe you get a, a few of your, uh, your, your kids or a few of your friends to come help you. And maybe you have a few people like me standing there watching and not being much help at all. Um, you know, but for Oku, this was a a fun thing to try something new, learn something new, and uh, and find a new way to to connect with with the environment of his his homeland. So, sea ice has for 
you know, countless generations been that, that home for people, that source of food, that basis of tradition, a sense of, of meaning, a place to innovate and so on. And of course, as we all know, sea ice has been changing very fast lately. And I put this within my lifetime. Um, when I first went up to, to Utkiagvik in 1988, we spent about six weeks out on the ice camping and counting whales and so on, traveling around by snow machine and occasionally by dog team. Um, and I got a sense of, you know, kind of what the sea ice environment looked like and in that and subsequent years. Um, I moved down to Anchorage in the early 90s. We'd go back up to Geogvik from time to time and you know, at some point in there went out again and was out there with a friend and said, well, you know, is it just me or is this really a different ice scape than than it was used, you know, than it was when I first came up here. And my friend just shook his head and said, oh, it is just completely different. And I don't consider myself the most observant of people when it comes to looking at, at a sea ice environment. This is not my, my home where I'm familiar with all, all the details and so on. So if it was that obvious to me, that, that tells me that, yeah, things really are, are changing and changing fast. The upper right photo was taken in, in Kotzebue in northwestern Alaska in November 2019. This is November above the Arctic Circle, and people are still out in boats, still out hunting seals in boats. Talking to people there, they, they acknowledge that this just felt really weird that it was, uh, you know, really they should be out on traveling on snow machine on top of the ice by this time of year. You know, it certainly would have been a, a couple decades earlier. Um, but now the ice is such that you know, it's freezing up just that much later. Um, you know, instead of sometime in October, it's still open water in, into November. And these are, these are enormous changes that are, there's just no escaping from. There are lots of ways, of course, that we monitor change scientifically. Um, what we see here is a, a, a sea ice thickness monitoring station. Uh, in the upper right photo, the fellow on the right is Andy Mahoney, a scientist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, who designed this fairly easy to install and easy to use system for monitoring sea ice. It does require somebody going out and, and taking the measurements. It's not an automatic system. Automatic systems have their problems with things icing up and, and clogging up and so on. But this is a pretty robust system. It's been used in Greenland, in Canada, in Alaska, copied in other places. Um, and in case you're curious, the upper right-hand photo was taken around midday in January. Um, the sun in Utkiagvik sets on November 20th and rises on January 26th. This was before the end of January sunrise. And so we're out at about, about noon. You know, keep that in mind with, you know, this is again, Wesley, Wesley Aiken's beautiful garden. Um, and that's, that's high noon. But through monitoring stations like this, we can get a really good sense of what's happening in a particular area. You know, and Andy had set up two or three monitoring stations around Barrow, two or three monitoring stations around some other communities. And then had the chance to, to uh, you know, examine those data, look at how the sea ice was forming, how it was getting thicker, what was happening with snow on top. And then also crucially, how it was melting in the spring and discovering things like the, the rapid melt in some places from the bottom of the ice. I would often think, well, it's, sunlight and, and warmer weather and warmer air and so on, and the ice will melt from the top. Yes, that does happen. And in some places, so also a little shift in, in water temperature and water current that can help erode the ice from the bottom. That's pretty interesting, especially if you're traveling on the ice. You know, the top may not give away the, what's happening underneath, and you could be on, literally on thinner ice than you, were, than you thought you were going to be. Of course, there's other ways to look at sea ice. Satellite imagery is is very powerful. We see these days every September, there's a flurry of news stories about the annual Arctic sea ice minimum based on satellite imagery. And it's a combination of things, being able to, to measure things in situ and then compare that with what the satellites are, are picking up and to make sense of what it is that we're, that we're seeing. So a lot, of, a lot of effort scientifically going into studying sea ice and, and measuring change and, and learning what it is that we can see. And all of, all of which is very valuable for, for many reasons. As I'm sure you've picked up by now, I have a tremendous respect for the, the knowledge of elders and, and others who are out on, on the land and on the sea a great deal in, in the Arctic. Uh, Andy Mahoney, the, the University of Alaska scientist on the right, Warren Matumiak, another uh, 
Utkiagbek Elder on the left. Over, over Warren's back and head, you can see Wesley Aiken and, and Ben Itak. Um, Andy and Warren are looking at some satellite images of sea ice in the, the Utkiagbek area and comparing notes on what it is they see what are the features that strike them as being, being important and interesting? Uh, there will be a narrow band of ice just off the coast, anywhere from half a mile to several miles of what's called shore fast ice. Uh, adhered to the shore, uh, some of the big, big pressure ridges and so on will also extend down to the sea floor and provide a bit of an anchor. So that generally doesn't move. Offshore from the shore fast ice, you have a much more dynamic environment. Ice, ice moving around that can come crashing into this shore fast ice and disrupt the shore fast ice or can can blow out and, and you know go away leaving a lot of open water and understanding that transition zone understanding the stability of the shore fast ice how fast the offshore ice is moving and so on all of that is crucial to success and safety on on the ice and so to me it's just a privilege to be able to watch you know, two experts, Andy, who really knows the science about sea ice, Warren, who really knows the life on sea ice, see how much they can, they can learn from each other. And to me, that's been one of the important aspects of my career has been helping uh, document the type of knowledge that Warren and Wesley and, and Ben and others have um, so that that's part of the record as well. And we're not just using you know, what we learned from a, a few monitoring stations or, or from satellites high above the earth. As I mentioned with, with the story of Ben Ita's life, there's more to change than just what's happening in the environment. On the left, Amaklanuk and Inuk from, I believe, Iglulik in Northern Canada is using a, you know, a modern saw, but to build, to start building an igloo, traditional snow house, um, you know, in the style of his ancestors and the style that's been, been used for a long time. Um, that, those kinds of things are, are alive and well. On the right-hand photo, uh, Mike Jaypudi from Clyde River and on Baffin Island is uh, a, a remarkable filmmaker, um, also a, you know, very much dedicated to, to documenting the story of his culture, the, the place names, the stories of people and so on. And in this photo, he's not in the Arctic. He's in a remote valley at 10,000 feet in Nepal. We had a small grant to be able to, to make a, a Nepal Arctic exchange. Mike was part of that. And so, you know, think about his horizons versus those of, of people from you know, only a generation or two ago. You know, how much more he's been able to see in going to a, a completely different place halfway around the world, learn about those cultures, but also, you know, very interestingly to see, see many things in common between the, the close to the land and, and respectful of the environment, way of life of the, the people in the, in the Himalayas you know, as compared to the, the ways that things are done in, in the Arctic. Also think about change in terms of energy and that the left-hand photo, despite the, you know, the large flat screen TV in the, in the background and so on, a Greenlandic woman is tending the seal oil lamp. This is a, a shallow bowl carved out of, out of stone with seal oil in it and a small wick probably made from, traditionally made from, from say moss. And this would have been the source of light and heat through much of the, the winter, through much of the year for, many communities around, uh, around the Arctic. On the right-hand side, uh, we have a futuristic looking hydrokinetic turbine. The, this will sit on the bottom of the ocean, uh, bottom of the uh, Kvichak River, just off of uh, Igiagik in Southwestern Alaska. The, the curving blades in the middle will, will be turning with the, the force of the water current and generating electricity. And if this is successful, Two of these could probably replace, probably provide all of Iggy Agik's electricity needs. They wouldn't need to rely on, say, the diesel fuel that runs the, the standard generators, diesel fuel that's you know, pumped from somewhere, shipped somewhere else to be refined, and then shipped back to Iggy Agik, uh, to be burned and stored in a big tank that sits on the side of the river where it poses some kind of a hazard to the, all the salmon that are, that are migrating up and down the river. Um, again, huge changes going on. Interestingly to me, with the, the hydrokinetic turbine, a return to a local source of energy. So fossil fuels have been terrific in terms of providing abundant energy throughout the world. Uh, they obviously have some enormous side effects as well. 
being able to replace that with by drawing on the harnessing the energy that's coming down that river every second of every day of every year would be a, a tremendous advance. Documenting terminology is also important. Isa Kidlock, whom we last saw you know, standing by the seal hole on the, up, up on the fjord, um, is here recording the detailed terminology of, of uh, the Inuit about, I, th I think in this case, I don't read or speak the language, so I can't guarantee this, but my recollection is here we were probably talking more about weather than about sea ice. Nonetheless, a whole bunch of specialized terminology and, and details about exactly how people understand the, the weather, the, the interactions among the, the different pieces of the, the weather system. Um, so I'm trying to get into that level of detail is, is tremendously important because we can then see the types of things that, that change. You know, what are the terms that people have had to invent more recently to, to describe term, the conditions that they hadn't seen before? Or what are the terms that, that uh, you know, used to be commonly used and really just now don't have much, uh, much use? Um, I've seen that from the Northern Bering Sea, terms for thick multi-year sea ice that uh, you know, used to be fairly common in the region and now, now is hardly ever seen. Um, of course, specialized language exists in, in any language you know, among people who are practicing a, a particular craft or, or field. Um, and it's really important to be able to have people like Isa who can help document and really dig into the details in Inuktitut, you know, and then try to explain it to us in English. Because if we just went straight to English with a quick translation, we'd probably gloss over a lot of the finer points and so on that are really necessary for trying to understand what's, what's going on and how people see and interact with that environment. Um, you know, the, the way that we describe things is, is an important part of of how we interact with that environment. In terms of implications for, for people, uh, Juili Sanguya, who's in the, the left-hand photo, is a, another filmmaker, also hunter from, from Clyde River on, on Baffin Island. And uh, we had a project where we were comparing sea ice in Northern Greenland, uh, Northern Canada, and Northern Alaska involving uh, site visits by people from each place to the other places. Juili was part of that. We'd been out in the ice and we're back in the in the you know, big room, sitting around a table talking about things. And those of us who are the visiting academics were kind of prodding Joe Ely to, to give us a, a nice little sound bite. You know, well, with all these changes, is it, is it harder to get seals? And Joe Ely would patiently explain that, you know, it wasn't necessarily harder, but it was, you know, explain what he thought was going on. And we kept pushing him for that, you know, sort of sound bite version. And finally, Joely looked slightly exasperated and said, well, it's not that simple. I think that became the title of our paper. And his point was, as, as I explained with, with people in Kotzebue, it wasn't that he couldn't get seals. It was that it felt really odd to be out in a boat in open water at a time of year when you really felt like you should be on top of the ice on a snow machine. He knows how to get a seal from a boat. He knows how to get a seal from a snow machine. So it wasn't that one was necessarily harder than the other or more productive. It was just that it was really, really weird and really odd. And this change in season is something that you know, sort of very disruptive for people, people's understanding and, and familiarity with an environment that they, they know so well. Those kind of details, again, are, are crucially important. Uh, sitting on the snow machine on the right-hand side of the, the lower photo is Joe Levitt and a New York whaler from Utkiagvik. Um, this was part of a graduate course on sea ice being taught up there. I came up to, to help with that. Um, we took half of the students out to the ice edge in the morning, left-hand photo, gorgeous day, get out to the edge of the shore fast ice where you could see the moving ice further offshore. Joe could explain some of the things that were going on, what the whalers looked for and so on. And we had a wonderful time, went back to, to, the, to town, uh, you know, had lunch, we're telling stories about what we'd seen to the other half of the students who were going to go out in the afternoon. So they were all excited to, for the afternoon journey. Um, we got partway out to the ice edge and Joe suddenly stopped, turned around and said, okay, we're going back. And we'd explained beforehand that people were welcome to ask Joe questions and, and find out what was going on when we were in a safe place. But when we were out on the ice and if Joe said we needed to do something, no one, we were not to question, we were not to doubt or 
dawdle. We were just to do it, just make sure to listen. And so sure enough, we retreated back far enough where Joe felt comfortable. And he explained that in the course of a couple hours, a few subtle things had changed in terms of the wind, in terms of the currents, in terms of the things he was seeing with the ice. And he didn't like it. And he didn't feel comfortable taking all of us out, being responsible for all of us out at the ice edge in, a con in conditions where he thought something might happen. And again, I spoke earlier about this question of probabilities. I wasn't certain that anything was going to change. It's very hard to be, to be definite. And it's also interesting to think about people who are going out to the ice edge in the Arctic, getting ready to get into an 18 foot skin boat to go after a 50 foot whale in water that's a couple degrees below freezing, be below 32 because it's seawater, salt water, to think of them as being risk averse or cautious. And yet part of the success in that environment is precisely to be very, very cognizant of the risks you're taking and to be very reluctant to take any unnecessary risks. Now, if Bill had had a good reason to go out to the ice edge if something important was happening, I have no doubt he would have gone. To take a bunch of graduate students out while there was some risk that he could identify just wasn't worth it. Sure, the students would have liked to go out there. That, that was rather immaterial. That wasn't sufficient reason. So it's interesting to think about you know, the, the level of detail that Joe's attending to and also all the variables of the situation, the context, his knowledge of how the ice works and so on, all of the things that go into that decision of whether, whether or not it's time to go out on the ice or whether, whether it's a good idea to go out or not. I'd like to shift now um, to just a quick summary of a few of the other aspects of, of sea ice and why it matters. Um, for marine mammals that live in sea ice, like bowhead whales, pictured in the upper right, um, there have been some big shifts. The, the map on the left shows where the whales would typically hang out in, in winter, um, well, time period 2009 to 2016. These are some whales with satellite transmitters attached to them. Only a couple of years later, 2018 to 19, that distribution had dramatically shifted up into the Bering Strait between Alaska and Chukotka, part of Russia, and even up into the Chukchi Sea. And this just seems extraordinary that whales would still be in the Chukchi Sea and in the middle of winter when sea ice is at its, at its peak. Um, you know, these kind of changes have, are, are a big deal in terms of the ecology of the area. The Bering Sea is a huge area for fisheries, of course. As the food web shifts, as, as species shift around, you know, this can have big implications for, for some of the, the U.S.'s largest fishery. Um, polar bears, too. Uh, they get a lot of attention with climate change and pictures of polar bears balancing on little ice flows and things. One thing is it can in lead to an increase of polar bears coming into communities or doing things. What we see in the, that middle picture with the little conduit and the wires, uh, this is a remote weather station that some colleagues and I had installed. And for some reason it attracted a polar bear who came up and decided to be a bit of a vandal and chew through the wires and otherwise be a, be a nuisance, this, this kind of stuff can and, and does happen. That's pretty benign, but having a polar bear wander through town when kids are heading off to school and so on is obviously a very different situation. Um, yeah, it's, you know, common phrasing these days, you know, what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. When we're losing a lot of sea ice, we can actually have effects on hemispheric weather patterns. Uh, the loss of ice in the, the Chukchi Sea at the sort of bottom part of the, the map on the left, um, can affect the jet stream, which in turn can, can produce things like, or exacerbate things like droughts in the West, severe winter weather in the, the East and so on. And so understanding those connections becomes important. And as the sea ice environment changes, you know, we're then discovering things that we may not have understood before about those deep connections between what happens in the Arctic and, and what happens throughout the rest of the Northern Hemisphere. Sea ice is also a nice bright, shiny surface. We've seen uh, the pictures of the Earth from the Moon, you see the you know, bright white of the of the Antarctic or of, of the Arctic, where snow or ice are. Um, that's great. It's great for helping keep the Earth cool. Think of the difference between a white car and a and a dark car on a on a bright sunny day. We can examine that. And we can think about the amount of sunlight that is reflected into space off of sea ice versus the amount that would be absorbed by open water if the sea ice isn't there. 
we can express that in terms of the, the amount of additional warming the Earth gets, put that in terms of you know, how much e the equivalent amount of carbon dioxide that would be released into the atmosphere. And then there have been various efforts to understand what's sometimes called the social cost of carbon. You know, the amount of, of cost that it'll pose for people around the world to, as, as we warm and disrupt things. And what we quickly get looking at the type of sea ice change, the sea ice loss that's occurring in the Arctic, is this cost for, for humans, for societies around the world is quickly going to get us into the, the tens, tens and even hundreds of billions of dollars. So this is not a trivial change. And unfortunately, this is a, a positive feedback loop in that if you have more less ice, the water gets warm, absorbs more sunlight and gets warmer, which then melts a little more ice, which then you know, continues that cycle. And so it's a tough one to break out of and something that you know, is, a, is an additional challenge as we're trying to combat climate change globally. Opening up large sections of the Arctic you know, where there's open water now, you know, theoretically, at least that opens it up for fishing. And this is actually a nice story that the areas are, are potent, you know, physically open for fishing. But first the US, then Canada, and then other countries thought, well, hang on, is that really a good idea? We don't know so much about the area. Maybe we should not fish there first. Um, map on the left shows the, the, the high seas, the, the, areas of the area of the Arctic Ocean in the red, inside the red polygon. Um, that is beyond anybody's 200 mile limit. The middle image is a, a letter signed by 2000 scientists around the world that some colleagues and I wrote um, calling on Arctic leaders to do the right thing and not you know, learn about the environment before we started fishing. The right, right hand picture shows a little bit of this, the central position of Arctic cod in the Arctic food web you know, and how important they are and how many things would be affected if we started hoovering Arctic cod out of the sea. Great news is that eight Arctic countries, uh, or the Arctic countries joined by the European Union, China, Korea, and Japan, uh, all agreed not to fish in the Central Arctic Ocean until we know something about it. Um, and this is, I think, a, a tremendous success of, of a precautionary approach. This doesn't resolve climate change, but at least it reduces the human, human footprint that we're having on an ecosystem that's already under, under considerable stress. Uh, similarly with shipping, uh, shipping through the Arctic gets a fair bit of attention. The map on the left shows the, the various passages of the Northern Sea Route on the left, the Northern Sea Route or Northeast Passage on the right, and then the, the potential for a transpolar route straight through the middle. Um, the transpolar route hasn't really happened yet. I think the Northern Sea Route, of course, is going to be in question for a, a while now. Northwest Passage is getting a little attention, but not a huge amount of traffic. But the right-hand picture shows the Bering Strait. And again, in the good old days when the US and Russia were willing to talk to each other, they had jointly proposed to the International Maritime Organization, which governs such things, shipping routes and areas to be avoided in the, in the Bering Strait. Again, doesn't solve the problem of, of climate change, but at least it helped keep a, some control over the human actions that are, that are also affecting that ecosystem. It's nice to see when there are times that uh, you know, we, we do seem to be getting things right. Um, you know, shipping, well, perhaps we don't have time to go into this. Uh, briefly, there are various kinds of shippings in, in the Arctic. The left-hand one is a, a barge coming to resupply a community, obviously very important. The lower right picture is Shanghai. Hopefully not these ships in the picture, these barges, but you know, the, the idea of transit from East Asia to, to Europe via the, via the Arctic is one that has gotten a lot of attention and, and popularity. Um, you know, the extent to which that becomes a, a big deal remains to be seen. We also have the question of whether shipping is an opportunity uh, you know, for, for tourism, for, for trade and so on, um, or an impact. Austin Amasuk from Nome in the upper right-hand photo was pretty steamed about the idea that a whole bunch of tourists were coming up past Nome and continuing up into the Arctic Ocean and through the Northwest Passage, viewing this as a you know, wonderful and exciting thing to do. And Austin was saying, hang on a sec, this is a terrible symptom of what's happening to the world. And what, why are we celebrating this? And that, that's a good point as well. Um, as we think about the way things change, as we think about what we're doing in the Arctic, raise the question of experts and expertise. Me on the left, 
I have a PhD. I'm usually um, always speaking in, in English, which is usually the international language of science and other things. I'm familiar with PowerPoints and that kind of stuff. That's one form of expertise. who we remember from innovating and catching those fish deep in, the, in Baffin Bay earlier. Um, you know, doesn't speak a whole lot of English, but he has tremendous expertise as well. So how do we involve someone like Ilku? How do we make sure that we're not just limiting ourselves to those who are you know, facile and, and fluent and available in, in, uh, in the you know, settings where, where a lot of things happen? Um, also, what exactly is expertise? You know, book knowledge and so on, the ability to write a scientific paper. I have those things. I'm a clinic on the left, sure knows how to build an, an igloo. He can do it a whole lot faster than I ever will be able to. Now, that's a form of expertise as well. George Nungok in the middle is a, a whaler, but also a, a drummer and culture bearer from Savunga in the Northern Bering Sea. His knowledge of his people's history of their interactions with their environment through song and dance is, is tremendous and impressive. Uh, the Sami woman on the, the right-hand photo, you know, their material culture, their, the things that they, they create, the things that they use in herding reindeer and, and moving around their environment, now, again, another form of expertise, but not one that sometimes we we tend to overlook. We look at at also in terms of how we characterize things. This is a an offshore oil drilling platform on the in actually off the north coast of Canada when this photo was taken. Um, you know, the, the engineers who built this would say, well, you know, we've we've compared this to what we expect from sea ice, and it can we think it can stand what's going to happen. The Inupiaq whalers would then talk about the extremes, the, the super outlier events, you know, not the normal things that we would expect, but that once in a lifetime, once in a century, once in many centuries event that could just be devastating. Now, which are the ones that we should be concerned about and how do we think about that? It's a good question when we're considering what, what expertise means, statistics versus, versus that, that off chance that something might just go horribly wrong. So what next? Trust and respect are very important. Uh, Isa Kidluck, we've seen him a couple of times before. And then Glenn Liston, a snow scientist from Colorado State University, out on the land at one of those remote weather stations, just learning from each other. The chance to, to spend time together to learn about what each other does, the way each other sees the environment, to learn this, the, the strengths and the complementarity of the skills that we bring to the, to the conversation and to the enterprise. Those are all important things. Um, we also need to think about who's making the decisions. Greenlandic woman on the left, uh, protesting what's been going, what was happening with fisheries management and, and fish factories and trying to get a, a word in edgewise. Whereas on the right, again, good old days, a big meeting in, in Moscow about Arctic development with a you know, whole bunch of people in suits who've flown in from, from big cities here and there and are pontificating about what's going to, what could or should happen in the Arctic. Both of those have a role. How do, we, how do we connect them? How do we make sure that we respect both? Whose voices are included? Again, what we have here are three uh, Chukchi hunters from Northern Chukotka, the far Eastern part of Russia. These are guys who go and guard against polar bears with only armed with only a spear. They know polar bears. They know what to look out for when a polar bear is a threat and when it isn't. How do we include that kind of expertise? How do we include people like them from far remote communities um, and make sure that they aren't, aren't overlooked as well? Um, and do they have a place in a setting like this? This is a conference in Shanghai, again, about Arctic Ocean fisheries and so on. And there might've been one fellow from Greenland here. You know, is, is that sufficient? Is that, is that a respectful way to include somebody? Probably better than no people from Greenland, but can we do better? And how do we make sure those voices are are heard. And finally, uh, this question of indigenous knowledge, that detailed knowledge about the environment, that's not something you learn from a book. That's something you learn by doing. So how do we continue the societies and activities um, that, that produce that? Uh, and Inuvialuit elder in the upper left-hand photo with his granddaughter and her friend out in a boat catching some fish. The fact that they're out together, that they're learning from him, that they're in the boat with him, that gives me hope that you know, they're going to learn firsthand the skills and, and understanding of the, the environment that, that he has to offer. Similarly, kids in the 
off of uh, the coast of Baffin Island in the right, out fishing through a, a crack in the ice. They'll be speaking to each other in Inuktitut. They'll be practicing traditional ways. As long as that's going on, and I think we have some hope of retaining many of these incredibly valuable perspectives and knowledges about what, what the Arctic is like. Um, I'm sure I've used up more of my time than I should have, but I appreciate your, your patience. Um, I am done there and I'm happy to turn it over to Gail. Great, Henry. Thanks so much. This was this was really amazing. I think I, I loved it. It was really good. And it was fine that you went a bit over because um, our respondent was not able to tune in today. So uh, taking up some extra time was actually a, a good thing. Um, let me start off with the questions, but let me remind the audience uh, that you can always put your questions in the Q&A section um, and uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll try to get to all of them. Um, the first one's from Paul Carr. How do we present the melted Arctic? How do we present the melted Arctic from being new sources of fissile fuel, fuels? I think maybe fossil fuels that will increase global warming. Yeah, great, great question. And I, I'm assuming that also is how do we prevent the melted Arctic? I mean that um, I, I mentioned the, the example of Austin Amaso questioning why we were celebrating the idea that the Arctic was now a place for cruise ships to just zip through the Northwest Passage. I think the same thing is true there. And that in Alaska, that's a, that's a big deal. There are many people who would love to carry, characterize this as a, an opportunity. Hey, this is a great chance. Look at how much more we can reach and how easily we ought to be doing more and more. Um, you know, obviously, if we continue down the path we're on, we can have a sense of where that's going to take us and it's not someplace good. And I think being able, to me at least, my hope is that by being able to tell some of these stories um, about what's going on, to understand the what we're losing when when the ice is melting and not just to see it as a, you know, a neat chance to do something um, will help. Ultimately, of course, you know, where people see a buck to be made, there's going to be a lot of people clamoring to make that buck. And that's where examples like the, the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, again, give me some hope that 10 countries got together and said, you know, let's hold off on this for now. Let's see where this is going before we get too carried away and start causing more problems. Great, thanks, Henry. Uh, next question, and I'll call in Maynard after after um, I do the next question. Um, Jane and Stephen Ward and Waller, the bowhead, the bowhead whale habitat change in the Bering Strait was based on a much smaller sample size. Could it be not representative of the entire species? Sure, and that that's a great question as well. Um, I can't remember now what the how many whales were involved, how many had satellite transmitters on them, and it's always a very good question to say, well. You know, is, is this what all of them are doing or is this just a, just a handful? Did we, did we get the, say the wrong sample? Um, and that's one of the things, that, another reason if I'll make another pitch for working closely with, with the, the people from the area, um, having interviewed people from the North coast of Alaska about the, the timing and nature of the bowhead migration, they will point out that it's not sort of a, a uniformly distributed mishmash of all the different ages, sizes, and genders of, of whales, but you can get different waves. And so it, you could easily wind up going at a particular time of year and getting, say, a whole bunch of young male whales or a whole bunch of older female whales. And they may do something very different than the rest of the population. Um, so being aware of who you're sampling and, and what they may or may not represent for the whole population. A really good question. What we can see is then using other information to try to corroborate what we're seeing. And so there, are, you have communities in those areas who can report that you know, hey, it was really weird. We saw bowhead whales swimming past in March. That never happened before. That's really important to, to document. Um, there are also a number of efforts to put out uh, satellite, I'm not satellite, excuse me, uh, acoustic recorders, you know, basically a, a tape recorder sitting down under the, under this, underwater, uh, listening, and then you go and record it and see who you could hear the whole time. And, and those have produced some big surprises as well. And the number of species and how far north some of them are. Um, and so I think from a number of different sources, we get some corroboration that 
what we learned from the satellites is not completely anomalous, but seems to be consistent with what we're seeing in, in other ways as well. But Great, really good you. question. We want to make sure we get that corroboration. Let's not base everything one source. Now, you know, I, what has happened is our, our, our respondent has actually joined us. Um, so I, I feel like it would be really good if we gave her the opportunity to, to respond um, to, to what was said. So uh, Maureen, uh, are you on and ready to respond? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, let me let me just do a, a quick introduction so that everybody knows who, who's talking. So Ma Maureen Panjuli Panjuli is uh, the coordinator of the Pacific Net Network on Globalization. She has a lot of experience in the Pacific region. Her work she her work looks at the intersection between indigenous worldviews, science, and policy. She has a really cool uh, go, go to the Pang, the Pacific Northwest on Globalization website, and you'll see a lot of uh, good work that's going on there. Maureen, and I apologize, I just didn't see that you'd come on. A uh, very good morning from Suva, Fiji. Um, big thank you to IRS, um, Gail, for, uh, I don't know what happened. I think I got, I entered and was named someone else. Um, but also really a big thank you to Henry Hun Huntington for that really inspiring one hour session, just taking us through uh, sea ice. I mean, my initial reactions was how very alien this particular conversation is, given that I'm sitting almost 13,000 kilometers away in an ocean that's really different. Um, I come from an area that's really warm, um, just to be listening. And yet there are so many similarities and things that are very familiar um, that you raised. Um, and I wanted to really just focus on the things that are familiar and relates, because I think one of our biggest challenges today is really viewing the world from uh, these kinds of different and separate rather than what's similar and links us all together. So I was really, um, obviously a lot of the, the stuff on indigeneity around values and value systems are obviously quite critical. So, you know, the, the conversations around generosity, the spirit of sharing within communities is quite um, significant here in the Pacific. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the Pacific Ocean. Obviously, it is one of the largest oceans in the world. Um, I come from a region where uh, the landscapes can be quite stark. I think people tend to think of Pacific and maybe look at it through an exotic uh, landscape. But in fact, some of our landscapes are extremely stark. And I understand when, when Henry is talking about uh, ice and, and how uh, alien and formidable that environment can be, some of our landscapes are, can be quite formidable for people when they first arrive. So I want to just touch a little bit about some of these kinds of landscapes and particularly atoll island nations. Um, when you're talking about atoll island nations, they're quite small in landscapes. Uh, for example, a country like Tuvalu, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, just around the equator, east of Australia, if we want to look at how to locate. Uh, its land area is something like um, 10 square miles. Um, it's less than five meters above uh, sea level. Um, so, you know, its highest point anywhere on the island is less than that. It's quite stark in the sense that it's very difficult to grow food on land because of the amount of salt. salt. Um, its freshwater systems are currently under stress due to sea level rise. Uh, and then you've got other countries like Nauru, which is about 20.98 square kilometers, Marshall Islands, which is about 183 181.3 square kilometers. So when you've been to an environment like Cot Cot uh, Atoll Nations, it's quite formidable in that sense. Um, but yet the indigenous knowledge systems, the understanding of things like sea level rise uh, is quite critical. Um, inundation of freshwater, saltwater 
uh, fresh water uh, aquifers is quite critical also. So where this knowledge sits and how it complements science is, is, is for me, were the two tracks that I thought, and I saw lots of familiarities with that. Where does the knowledge sit? Uh, this kinds of repository knowledge holders sits with our elders. The kinds of transmission of knowledge through generation obviously is quite critical. There's challenges to how indigenous knowledge system uh, is taking place at this point. But, and, and I do really respect the, 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 this idea that science, I mean, for us in the Pacific, you know, when you've come from a place where historically indigenous knowledge system was looked down as inferior, and now this emphasis to really relook at what role it can play in terms of climate change, understanding natural systems, I, it's really reassuring to hear those kinds of conversations taking place um, at a much more critical level right now. So I think for us, a, a key challenge is really assuring our indigenous knowledge holders, particularly our elders, that their knowledge system is quite critical today and what role it, it can play in path, this pathway going forward. And so I really was quite happy that my internet could hold and I could listen, but I was wondering whether Henry would have any, uh, you know, to look at the two oceans together. Um, and particularly because my understanding is the Pacific Ocean is the warming part that links to the Bering Sea and obviously to the Arctic region. And that the, how the two systems are quite connected in a way so that we don't look at the ice landscapes or the sea ice landscapes as separate to what's happening in the Pacific. I think the dynamics links it together and I think it would be useful to look at how to link rather than how to keep these things separate. But I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and certainly the questions that have come through. But those are just my initial uh, observation and response to the presentation. Thank you, Gail. Thank you so much, Maureen. And we'll, we'll give Henry the chance to respond. Sure, well, thanks. Thank you, Maureen, for that. I, I, you're, both for your kind words and for your insights. Um, I went many years ago to a a, a big international global conference on human dimensions of global change. And for a variety of reasons at the time, I just thought, I, I, I want something wacky and different. I mean, I'm used to the Arctic. I'm going to go to other talks. And I went to a, as much by chance as anything, to a whole bunch of talks from sub-Saharan Africa. And it was the same reaction, which was for the first half of the talk, I thought, boy, how wacky and different. And for the second half of the talk, I thought, wait a sec, this all sounds really familiar. And it became fascinating. And I had a great time being able to talk with some of the, the researchers from those areas, um, even brought several to, uh, to Fairbanks for a conference. We had a chance to spend some, some time in Alaska together. And it was really fun to go with women from East and West Sub-Saharan Africa to a remote community in Alaska. And for them to have that same experience of saying, hang on a sec, this reminds me of home for the following reasons. Like, okay, good. What are those connections? Oh, so, I love the idea of the connections. I agree with you completely that we tend to look, I mean, indigenous knowledge for a variety of reasons is often very locally specific. What is, what is appropriate on Tuvalu may not be 100% applicable on Fiji. In fact, probably certainly is not 100% applicable on Fiji, much less in the Aleutian Islands at the other end of the Pacific. But I think we do have to do a better job of trying to connect those, those things and understand what those connections are to get a, a bigger picture. That's been a huge advance in science over the past you know, century or more has been making those connections and understanding a global system. And right now, I think with, with the way that we in the sciences certainly have approached indigenous knowledge, it's still been at the level of bits and pieces fragmented rather than trying to tell that that more comprehensive story. And so some way of being able to do that, I think would be a, a, you know, a tremendous advance. Um, the final thing I'd say is I, I think I, one of these things where I think, okay, how, how, how did I miss this for so much of my career? But the more I've thought about this lately, the more I've appreciated that it's, it's not just the factoids. 
yes, it's very helpful to know that, hey, this reef used to be out of water at low tide and now it isn't. No, that's, that's important. What's really crucial though is what you do with that information. And one, one Aleut elder from, from Alaska had you know, constantly been emphasizing this idea of, of indigenous wisdom. And I thought for a long time, I sort of thought, well, that's, you know, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. I'm not sure what you mean. And finally dawned on me. It's like, oh, actually he's got the heart of it right there. How do we understand that relationship that we have with, with our environment, with one another? And the, the invitation, Maureen, that you're providing, you know, how do we, how do we connect Fiji and Alaska to, to understand what, how is it that we're on this earth? What are the ways that we're doing? What are we leaving? What are we doing? And how does that, because I think there's a tremendous amount to be learned from people who have been that close to the environment for so long and have learned the ways of, of being in harmony and being in rhythm. And I, I don't wish to be romantic about you know, the, the people who always get things right. Certainly indigenous peoples have plenty, you know, they're human like the rest of us and get everything, take their share of mistakes. But I think when you look at a society and you say, well, you know, prove it to me that you know what you're doing, well, we've been doing this for a couple thousand years and we're still doing it, is a pretty good reply. So how do we, how do we get beyond the, you know, sort of the, the superficial knowledges and get into that, you know, more the, the philosophies and values that I think are so, so important for how we can live a, you know, a, a good life in, with, the, with the planet that we have? Great, thank you. You know, I'm going to ask, I'm going to take the privilege of, because I'm the moderator, of being able to ask a question, sort of the, you both can answer. And that is, one of the things that sort of, Henry, you sort of brought out, and Maureen, you did too, is how traditions are changing because of climate change. So then the long, so, so while we're trying to keep this kind of corporate memory, what happens in the next 20 years when we no longer have fishing in this area, or we no longer have certain things that we used to, does that totally get lost from the, from, from the indigenous memory? Maureen, I've spoken plenty today. Um, I think that the, the climate crisis situation is driving indigenous knowledge in particular ways. One is there's a real uh, push to um, almost reclaim knowledge that's lost. So, you know, there's a greater emphasis to really look at what, what knowledge systems we might have lost and then how do we um, uh, get those practices and, and, and see who remains alive and has that knowledge to start the process of documentation. So there's lots of revival. So in the Pacific, uh, it's around things like um, resilience to category six uh, cyclones or hurricanes, if you like, category five um, cyclones. So looking at architecture, and I think it comes back to what um, Huntington was talking about, which is around innovation. So, you know, looking at how we built our structures uh, historically, um, and then to then associate that with new knowledge, which could be scientific, um, to enhance our infrastructure systems. But for the most part, we are looking at reclaiming a lot of those lost knowledge. So it's definitely an infrastructure. We're certainly seeing a revival of knowledge around food and food systems, production systems. Um, again, to see where uh, root crops in particular, whether there is climate resilience uh, in terms of root crops and where that, that you know, that's those practices are still alive, um, partly because we need a wider range of things that we can bring forward. So again, there's lots of recovery of knowledge, traditional knowledge systems around food and food uh, uh, production mainly around crops and crop seasonal seasonality. But there's, there's, there's a sense that because of how fast uh, our systems are changing, um, we need to really look at to what extent it's still applicable. So again, migratory species of fish stocks, uh, it's clear now that uh, a lot of fish stocks are now moving in ways that we probably indigenous knowledge system would have understood it quite differently, 
But based on climate change now, a lot of that is moving. So again, a lot of emphasis today is to go back to reclaim a lot of that knowledge, um, try to document it as fast as we can. Um, and I think it, it, in the various ways of documenting it. And then, so we're seeing it in, in infrastructure, food systems, uh, fisheries in particular, or the marine environment in particular. Um, we have emerging, uh, how do I word this? I mean, it, it's really around um, migration, uh, internal migration of people. So really looking at how indigenous knowledge systems around uh, where people used to live, where, you know, relationships and how that might offer opportunities to relocate people safely within territories or across boundaries and territories. So we're really looking at indigenous knowledge systems in different places. Um, how do you study the weather, weather patterns? Um, how do you take those, those kinds of articulations into policy and policy making? But there is really a big push um, to kind of document, uh, unpack this kind of nuanced understanding. And so, yeah, it, it's kind of, it's not that simple and it's true. If I speak to my grandfather about how to read the weather system in relation to food systems, he will give me a particular reading. Um, so you can read the two elements together, but again, those are just held by very few people, mostly our elders, but there is this kind of recovery um, emphasis right now, documenting it so we don't lose it and see where we might think we've lost it and try to see how do we reclaim that. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Maureen. Um, Henry, you've been answering a question that Saul Katz asked, um, and I can't see the full question anymore, but uh, since I study the role of traditional food prep recipes as an evolutionary product of many centuries of evolution, how can we join with you to make a more formal study to the, these traditional to these traditional ways of knowing with current contemporary science? Um, I have tried at least, I hope successfully to send Saul my uh, email address so we can follow up later. It's a, that's a, a tremendous uh, invitation. I'm actually working on a proposal now to look at traditional ways of food handling and prep in relation to what veterinarians, my wife is a veterinary pathologist and the way that you know, veterinarians and others who look at wildlife health understand things, um, especially with the changes going on. But I'd like to just follow up on what Maureen said um, and emphasize three things that, that I think she covered very nicely as well. Um, one, traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge is not static. And oftentimes people like to sort of, and this is the problem with the word traditional, it's sort of the way it is. No, people have always been innovating, adding to their knowledge, exploring, experimenting, and so on. And that, you know, that needs to be celebrated. Yes, things are changing. This is not the first time in people's experience that things have changed and people have, you know, how do we foster that, that idea? Um, second, I think, is this question of, you know, the, the valuing of indigenous knowledge. And I mean, this is a, I think a bittersweet part of my experience is the degree to which people that I've worked with have then been appreciative of my efforts to, to document their knowledge. You know, sweet, because it's always nice to be, if people appreciate what you're doing. The bitter part is, why did it take that? Why on earth did it take somebody like me to come in and ask questions for people and others in society to say, hey, you know, this might be actually worth something. Heck no. This is an extremely important information. It's been valuable for a very long time. You know, we need to celebrate that and, and spread that message around. And the third thing, I'm, I'm thinking of a, an interview I had with Albert Simon, a, a UPIC from Hooper Bay in Southwest Alaska. Um, we, wanted, we were down there to talk about marine mammals and Albert being Albert had come in with a sheaf of notes, things he wanted to make sure he could talk to us about. And he patiently answered our questions about marine mammals and what they were doing and so on. And then he said, yeah, there's some things I wanna make sure you understand too. He then talked a lot about all the things that were were not changing. The importance of sharing, still very important. The importance of being prepared when you go out is not going to change. The importance of being in good relation with other people in your community is not going to change. And that's what I mean about some of these aspects of wisdom that I think also deserve 
deserve our attention. You know, this is not a technical solution that, hey, if we could only do a little bit better about how we catch fish, you know, everything will be fine. How do we understand the whole meaning of catching fish and how that serves us as communities, as, as individuals? And how do we retain that sense of connection with the environment rather than something to just be used and then moved on from, but something that we can we want to continue to be, you know, we want to use the terms, you know, stewards in, in the right way for the long term. And I think there's an awful lot in indigenous knowledge and practice that we can learn from there. I'm gonna take one more question from the box and then I'll let Maynard have the final question. Um, how do you see the effects of the geopolitical stresses? Well, if we're talking about the Ukraine, you know, it means effectively 40% of the Arctic is now off limits and it's hard to figure out how we're gonna connect with, with, uh, with Russia. Um, you know, obviously very sad for a whole lot of reasons and <laughs> let's, let's not get ourselves, you know, the Arctic is a small, small loss in comparison with what's going on in, in Ukraine. Um, you know, and in other terms, it's a real shame because we had been seeing some, you know, some good promise with the fisheries agreement, with the shipping and so on of collaboration between the US and Russia involving China and others and you know, how, the, how this is all gonna shake out and how long China continues to be on the side of Russia and the Ukraine situation, I have no idea. And it just is very distressing and you no, know, Again, very sad for the Arctic, but much sadder for the, the wider world. Thanks, thanks, Henry. I'm actually Ukrainian. It's very hard for all of us. Um, let me give Maynard the final question. Uh, thanks, Henry. Uh, can you just give us a brief um, uh, 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 clue about what you will emphasize in the in your report in the next and the coming national um, uh, uh, climate assessment, I uh, yes, and I can do that. We do we have did publish our outline, so it's not completely secret. Um, but we will the, the structure that we're looking at now is to try to look at. I think we had so it's the, for those who don't know that the U.S. National Climate Assessment is issued. I think it was supposed to be every four years, but I think they've hit about every five. A um, bunch of chapters, thematic chapters on oceans and agriculture and stuff, and then regional chapters on the Northeast and the Southwest and Alaska. I'm lead author of the Alaska chapter. The chapters are built around key messages. And the key messages that we're looking at right now are our health, our communities, our livelihoods, our built environment, our natural environment, our security, and finally, our hope is you know, what we're doing and what we're able to do in terms of, of adaptation. And within all of those, of course, we have 10,000 words to try to cover everything about Alaska and climate. So, you know, good luck. Um, but we would like to be emphasizing things like making sure that indigenous voices play a, have a strong presence in the chapter, that we're talking about matters of, of social and environmental justice, that we're looking at governance and so on. So I'm not quite sure exactly how we'll weave all these things together, but we're working on it. We have a really good team of, uh, of contributors and there should be, for those who are really interested, um, sometime in the fall, I think the, there will be a public review draft of the entire national climate assessment for anyone to take a look at and, and uh, comment on. So I encourage anyone who's really keen on this to take a look at the chapter or chapters that interest you when the time comes and uh, let us know what you think. Great, thanks, Henry. And thank you to both of you. Thank you, Henry and Maureen, both. This was just a really exciting session. I was, I'm really, I, I, I was thrilled by the presentations.